that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen, I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today on the program is Brandon Felker. How's it going, Brandon? Pretty good, Good. Chris. Th- thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Brandon is an ensemble member in Unexpected Productions down at the Market Theater, uh, where he also teaches improv classes. He's a member of the horror comedy group Blood Squad that performs regularly around Seattle, has kind of a cult following. Uh, he is also a legitimate actor, and you can catch him <laughs> this summer in a Wooden O's production of Love's Labor's Lost, uh, playing in free and parks all over western Washington. Anything else I'm leaving out? No, that's that's perfect. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long have you lived in the Seattle area? Uh, it's been about uh, 16, 17 years now. Okay. The actual cool. city of Seattle. Cool. What brought you out here? Uh, well, it was family first. Mm-hmm. And that we uh, moved out to Enumclaw, the infamous Enumclaw, mm-hmm. uh, for some people who remember that story. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. I remember. Of course. Yeah. I'll never forget. <laughs> never forget. Uh, and then I moved out to Chicago, did a bunch of improv stuff, and then moved back to Seattle. Second City. And- uh, yeah, I did Second City, did Improv Olympic, and then moved back to Seattle about 16 years ago to uh, actually finish my college degree. So okay. I went to UW. Cool. Mm-hmm. Awesome. How much do you know about local history? Uh, you know, I'd say maybe an average to less than average amount. Okay. You know, there's some things I know, some things that I certainly don't. I think that certainly don't is a greater percentage. Okay. Than, uh, you don't know do. more than you know. That's correct. I think yeah. that's, that's <laughs> technically true of everyone. Yeah, I think but, so. But yeah. good on you for admitting it because mm. most people don't, uh, yeah, I yeah. try to be really honest and open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. This is, good. This is going to go good. This is going to go good. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? None. Awesome. Yeah. So let's get started. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, Pericles Pantages. Holy. <laughs> was born in 1876 on the Greek island of Andros. He ran away from home at age nine and worked a variety of odd jobs trying to make ends meet for a few years before securing a job as a cabin boy on a schooner. Wow, okay. After three years working on the ship, he contracted malaria in Panama and was not allowed back on the vessel due to illness. He ran a donkey engine in the first French attempt at digging the Panama Canal. What, what, what's a donkey engine? I think a donkey engine is like a horse-drawn uh, like cart where they're like trying to pull... Or a donkey-drawn cart. A donkey-drawn yeah. cart, exactly. Okay. So it's like a horse-drawn cart, but with donkey. Right, and, with donkey and power. he was helping build the Panama Canal? The first attempt at building oh, a, the, the Panama Canal. Okay, right, so yeah, this which, is before the actual right, 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 Panama right, Canal was right, dug. Right, so they so tried to do it, and it, yeah, it didn't work. It was okay. a French attempt, and it didn't it didn't pan out. Yeah, because they're French. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm totally oh, kidding. burn! Pantages contract contracted malaria again. And, yeah, double malaria. Mm-hmm. A doctor told him he would die if he stayed in Panama, so he secured passage on a ship to the Puget Sound. Oh, okay. Upon arriving in Port Townsend, he was leaning against the railing of the ship, slipped, and fell into the freezing water. Wow, he fell off the ship. He fell off the ship okay, so, into the water. So he's uh, he's had a failure of building the Panama Canal. He's had double malaria, and mm-hmm. now he's fallen off a ship into the sound. Things aren't boating well no. for him. But he also, he's he's like... 14 at this point. Right. So he's, he's you know, yeah. Well, think about what you were doing when you were 14. Sure. And I certainly was not a, a deckhand on no. international vessels. No, no. I was spending a lot of time alone touching myself. <laughs> <laughs> All like, right. What is the rating of this podcast, by the way? You can say whatever you oh, want. Good, it's fine. Right. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have invited you on if it was anything <laughs> other than uh, no, anything no. other than, uh, than than say what you want. Sure. Okay. Great. But I'm sure Pericles was touching himself too. So I'm, that's I'm not sure he was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't find that in my notes, uh-huh. but I, uh, I I'm fairly certain that that that's that that was happening. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he later claimed that the cold shock cured him of his malaria. Oh. He said falling into the water was a good thing. Wow. 
Uh, somewhere around this time, Pericles started going by Alexander. During his years at sea and his stay in Panama, he learned to speak a dozen or so languages, though none of them perfectly. He was educated in the ways of the world, but couldn't read or write anything other than his own name. But he could speak 12 languages? He could speak about 12 languages. He taught himself He, he could that. get by. Well, he was traveling from port to port to port, and he was working with an international uh, crew, uh, so he he was picking up a lot. Okay. So he, uh, uh, yeah, he, he, could, he could get by in about a dozen languages. Okay, he could probably so. speak, like, transactional, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know. Yeah, enough get, to, like, you know. You know, buy something. Yeah, to, to do a little ask business. For passage someplace else. Right, kind of yeah. Thing. Okay, great. Wow. Uh, Pantages considered staying in Seattle, but opted instead to make a go of things in San Francisco, believing the opportunities there might be greater. Mm -hmm. I was in San Francisco. He took a job as a waiter in a German restaurant and was even left in charge of the establishment for a time when the owner left town. So he's like 15, yeah, and he's in charge of this business, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's he's doing well. Okay, so he's already kind of like a, <laughs> he's already got this entire breadth of history. Like uh, it reminds me of like Ernest Hemingway or like Louis L'Amour, both authors. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and they did like 500 jobs before they settled on being a writer. Right. So, you know, that kind of thing. Or whatever it is they end up doing. Mm -hmm. They have this huge history of stuff that they do. They settled on being I a writer. I always find that fascinating, right? Oh, yeah, settled <laughs> yeah. On, right? But at least they had the life experience to then be... Yeah, they had, they had the, con the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the content in their mind. Because I've had, like, four jobs in my whole life. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So okay. I, I don't have that experience of, like, you know, working through a whole bunch of different jobs and learning all this stuff. So I've mostly just been an actor, a mm -hmm. lifeguard, a bartender, and a... I cleaned a church for a while. <laughs> that's a that's a Hemingwayan kind of uh, kind of work. I history think of myself there. as little Hemingway. You little Hemingway, yeah. I worked a lot of jobs, but they were all shitty, and I didn't learn anything yeah, doing right, them. Sure. So a lot yeah. of like customer service and yeah, uh -huh. awful, awful jobs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was also in San Francisco. We began boxing. Uh, mm -hmm. He fought as a welterweight, short and stocky, five foot six and one hundred and forty four pounds. Good lord! He fought for a time before giving up on a prize fighting career, hoping to make uh, in hopes of making a fortune on his wits and business acumen. Yeah, well, yeah, he's got enough of that. Right? Yeah, and he can punch you out if he doesn't like it. He you. can. Yeah, that's a good combination. Yeah. Smarts and bronze. Sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Klondike Gold Rush struck in eighteen ninety seven, and tens of thousands of people started heading north, hoping to make their fortune. Pantages withdrew his life savings, $1,000, and booked passage to Skagway. Okay, so now he's going to go ahead and he's going to... Is he is he going with the Klondike Rush? He's trying to... He's going with the Klondike yeah, course, Rush, so yeah. So he's, he's going up to try to make it... He's make panning it, for gold. That's what he's going to try to do, uh, yeah. That's the goal. Because he's doing everything else. Yeah. That's interesting, right? A guy that has that much experience and seems to have a... In quite incredible work ethic, which might be in due to just surviving. Mm -hmm. But then he decides he wants to roll the dice on panning for gold. Well, he's got no roots. Yeah, he's sure. so he's just he's he's, he's, no he's, he's going to go mm -hmm. where the opportunity is, sure. and the opportunity at the time right. was in the Klondike. And, and he's, the perception was there was tons of gold up there, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So he uh, he's just going to to make a go of it, and yeah, see if right. he can make his fortune up there. Because right, right. why not? Yeah, I guess looking back, it seems like such a, a somewhat preposterous because there was very, actually very little gold up there, and the percentage of yeah. people that uh, actually struck gold was, was pretty small. About a hundred thousand people set off to go to the Klondike. Uh, -huh. uh three hundred people made more than ten thousand dollars. Good lord! That's how. That's yeah. how, but there's also. I mean, but he doesn't time, have that perspective. He doesn't have that perspective. Right. Also, uh, the Panic of 1893 was a big factor. The stock market crashed, uh -huh. and so people lost everything, uh -huh. and they were willing to risk everything okay. in order to go north and look for gold. And there, there, people were seeing that there weren't a lot of opportunities down here. And yeah, the perception was, and definitely wasn't helped by the uh, the kind of marketing campaign. Uh -huh. That you could just go up there and just pick nuggets up off the ground and, sure. and become incredibly wealthy. Right, 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 right. The Panic of 1893. Panic of 1893. Okay. The stock market crash. It was, right. it, 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 it was, we were kind of thrown into I just had heard that. Before. Right, yeah. Nobody, it's not a very well it was a, it part. was a small insignificant panic compared to the Great Depression. <laughs> sure. It was not, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, was, uh, it was much smaller. Gotcha. Okay, great. Uh, on the steamer north, seeing little else to do to pass the time, he gambled. And gambled, <laughs> and by the time the ship pulled into Skagway, he had 24 cents left to his name. Oh, yeah. not good at gambling, good at everything else. Good at everything else, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Uh, luckily, he was able to gain employment quickly as a waiter at Harriet Ma Pullen's establishment. Sure. She was a widow who traveled to Skagway with her four children and made pies for prospective miners. Oh, cool. The job only paid room and board, but it kept him from starving and freezing to death until he could figure out his next move. Sure, right. So he can, uh, he, he can, <laughs> he can do, again, do all these things, mm -hmm. and then he gambles away. All yeah, but he yeah. can curse in like twelve languages. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like, like Shiza, mm -hmm. you know, and and 
Do you know another one? Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, uh, 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 chinga? Uh, chupas mis huevos. Which I think means suck on my balls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, this is why I invited you on. For this, kind of, <laughs> this kind of insight. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. You bet. I learned that in like third grade or something like that. Cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, he schemed his way into a position as a guide over the White Pass Trail mm-hmm. for a group of prospective miners, even though he himself had never crossed this trail, trail and didn't know any more than they did. As a guide, he was able to cross the border into Canada without having to provide passage money. Okay, so he fooled these people. He fooled into these thinking guys. He was a guy. Yes. All right, and they were all they all like latched on and and okay, I'm so excited. He's, to he's kind of confidence manning his way yeah, into the situation. Yeah. Well, of course he would be right. Uh, when the team arrived at Bennett Lake, Pantages was expected to build a raft to float down the Yukon River to Dawson City, and he had no idea how to do this. So you go over the mountain passes, you get right. to Bennett Lake, and then you go up the Yukon to Dawson, where it's kind of the jumping off point for the gold fields. Right on a raft. On a raft. You got to go up. River on a raft. Well, you're going down river. You're right. you're navigating the, but you're going north. Oh, so gotcha. that's how I north is up in my mind yeah, always, yeah, yeah. no matter which way mm-hmm. up or down. So that makes yeah. Sense. So okay. he's got. A, he's, he's, they're going to float the river. Right. They're going to float downstream, but uh-huh. going north. And he has no idea. He has no idea how to do this. Okay. Yeah. So his plan was to walk around and see other teams building their rafts and start arguments with them. Mm. Um, he would tell them the way they were building the ra- their boats was inefficient, and when they explained to him why the tactics they were using were the best <laughs> method. He would take that information back and apply it to his own raft. Oh, that's fantastic. It's so smart. It's too bad. I mean, it's wonderful that they went ahead and say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, this is why it works. Because imagine if they had believed him. They're like, okay. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Like, All right. You seem to be an expert. We'll go ahead and change that. If everybody was just bluffing their <laughs> uh-huh. way to right. Dawson. <laughs> right. No, like, really yeah, was. no, you're, you're, you're right. Let's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then this story would be over. Yeah, this would, would be the end. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I've got a couple more pages of notes, so it's not over just yet. <laughs> okay, so they believed him, obviously. <clears throat> He built a makeshift raft, and it nearly sank when he put it in the river. Uh, he quickly pulled it out and bluffed to his clients that it was just a test of the fortitude, and the raft would simply be one pontoon of the finished product. Mm-hmm. So he constructed a second boat, lashed the two together, and set off down the perilous rapids to Dawson City. A later account said his method of navigating the waters was to, cl- to uh, quote, to close his eyes and trust that he was too young to die. <laughs> he didn't say that out loud. I hope not. No, I don't. I doubt he did. Right. I mean, he's such a con man, obviously. Oh, that, yeah. Wouldn't that be great? He's like, no, I know what I'm doing. Listen, just... we're all too young to die. Yeah. So let's just close our eyes and we're going to get there. We're just going to just... ride the Yetis. There's that's... no way the Lord's going to take us. It's right. too soon. All right. That's great. Love that. When he arrived in Dawson City, uh, his hopes for finding gold were quickly dashed by seeing the sheer number of men digging and that most would not find fortune for their efforts. He found a job making a whopping $45 a day as a bartender at Charlie Cole's Saloon. Wow, that sounds like a lot of money. It's though. a huge amount of money. Yeah. It's huge. I was going to say. It's a very significant amount of money. Because I bartend. And mm-hmm. if I make, you know, I, I bartend on off nights. Mm-hmm. But if I make 45 bucks in tips on an off night, I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, that's, a, that's a decent night to go down and just yeah. hang out. I do it at the, the theater I work at. Right, yeah. Uh, so 45 bucks in, in uh, that time would be, do you have any idea what the... Multiply it by about 40. Oh! He's making a shitload oh, of money doing baby. this. Yeah, so he's he making a struggled. whole lot of money. Yeah, yeah kind of. Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing of uh, mine the miners was the big mentality amongst mm-hmm. a lot of people was don't try to, don't look for gold, mm-hmm. try to get money out of the people Set who are foolishly looking for, for gold. The people. Exactly. And that that's sort where of the thing exists today. It really right? does. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's great. Uh, mixing drinks paid well, but there were other ways to make money. Uh, the saloon accepted cash as well as gold for payment, so he operated a small scale to weigh out the gold, and some small gold dust particles would fall on the bar or the floor below. Collecting this errant gold dust could yield as much as an ounce of gold a day. Wow. An ounce was worth about $19. Geez, so he's making money hand over he's making a lot. He's making a, he's making a very good living wow. in Dawson, not looking for gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He convinced Charlie Cole to turn the saloon into a box house with live entertainment. Uh, this brought in more business and was Pantages' first foray into the world of professional entertainment. And what's box house? Is a, that just like have a stage? So a box kind of house like... is you have a stage and you have a bunch of kind of boxes or you have a bunch of small rooms. Uh, you have a bunch of small rooms that uh, uh, you can have prostitution. Oh, yeah, so a bunch okay, of small so rooms for prostitution and burlesque and yeah, gambling right. and okay. basically turning it just from just a saloon into a more like... A larger entertainment venue. Sure, great, <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. yeah. So he and he that happened. They turned the bar into a box house. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Another gold strike in Nome sent Pantages there, and found he found a failing theater, the Orpheum. 
and convinced him to let him take over as manager. It was there he met a young woman named Kate Rockwell, better known as Klondike Kate, Queen of the Yukon. Okay. You know Klondike Kate? I do not. Heard, heard of the name? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, really? It sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah, she was a very well-known burlesque performer. At the okay. time, she was the most famous burlesque performer in the world. Oh, okay. And still is one of the best best uh, known okay, in history. Okay. And so he met her. He met in her Nome. At, in, in Nome okay. at the Orpheum Theater that he's now managing. Okay, correct. And the two began a love affair that uh, lasted years. Wow. Seats at the Orpheum were $12.50, uh-huh. and it was billed as the best show in Nome. Uh, soon the gold rush began to die down, and Pantages sold his interest in the Orpheum and headed back down to Seattle. Okay. Uh, he rented an 18-foot by 75-foot store on 2nd Avenue and opened it as the Crystal Theater. Uh, he ran the place almost completely on his own, booking vaudeville acts and even using a new entertainment to draw uh, uh, entertainment draw that could never have even conceived of movie projectors. Oh wow! So we bought and, a movie projector. And did he and, and he and Kate break up? They're still not Is it not long exactly. Distance? It's kind of long distance. That's it's a, not. There's tough. a yeah. That there's never works. there's he's not officially broken it off with Kate, yeah, but but the writing's on the wall. But they can Skype. You know, they can, uh, they they can text every day. It's free international texting. So, so, yeah. So they're, it's fine, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and they're still staying, they're staying committed to each other. I'm sure they are. Yeah. And and then maybe, maybe a little later down the road, they'll take a break Mm -hmm. and then they'll get back together and everything will be fine. Oh my God. Too real. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been through that. Yeah. Oh yeah. We all have. Yeah. Yeah, It's it's the worst. Uh, so tickets were 10 cents a piece, and he hoped to make his fortune in quantity. A patron said, quote, On Sundays, there was no such thing as a performance schedule at the Crystal, with people lined up at the box office waiting to, to get in. Yeah, because they were twelve fifty up at the Orpheum, right? And the Orpheum, yeah. Oh They're God. 10 so cents super here. super expensive up there. Super expensive. Yeah, but a spectacular show. You yeah. The greatest burlesque dance in the world. And so he decided to go the other way. Well, also, everything is insanely, insanely expensive in the Klondike. And still is. Yeah, yeah. Are you went up there? No, up in uh, not the Klondike. No, hmm. <laughs> no. But uh, I had a uh, ex girlfriend who lived up there for a while, um, and yeah, just getting in, like a pineapple up there was like, you know, well, you yeah, know, a pineapple. That's what I mean. Right? I bet salmon is decently priced. Sure. But, uh... I'm just saying. Now, all I'm saying is, this is what I'm saying to you: is that if you want something that's not already up there. It's expensive. Yeah, that makes sense. It costs a lot of money. Because you got to get it up there. And a pineapple costs like 14 bucks. That's a lot of money. That's $14 for a pineapple. That's, I, that's, I'm sure that's more. That's, I don't know how much a pineapple costs here. The same principle here. applies to Hawaii, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like getting a pineapple there, no problem. Right. But something that's not yeah. already in Hawaii mm-hmm. costs But like a lot of money. snow <laughs> yeah. is really expensive in Hawaii. It's super expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, you got to so you know import, saying. export. No, I'm picking up what you're putting down okay, for sure. sure. Right. Yeah. Most of that was bullshit. So, no, you're, it's, it's accurate, though. It's, it's sure. true. I don't know if it's $14 for a pineapple. Oh, but, uh, it is. It is? Oh, yeah. It's 14 bucks. Yeah. Okay. It, it absolutely How much is. is a pineapple here? Uh, it's like 12 <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> like pineapple was like five bucks, I think. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't actually bought a pineapple. Mm-hmm. Uh, people were lined up at the box office waiting to begin. Pantages would limit a vaudeville turn that usually was a stage, on stage 20 minutes to half the, that time. And the moving pictures streaked across the screen so fast that you could hardly recognize the scene. Turnover was all that mattered. Yeah, sure. So he's just ripping through just it. Just get them in, get them out. Boom. Here's ten cents, ten cents, ten cents. And what year was this? This is... This is about 18... Or 19... 100, 1901, okay. 1902. It's early 1900s. Yeah. I don't know the exact year for when the Crystal Theater opened. Yeah, and he's he's got projectors. He's got he's got a projector. Yeah. And he's yeah. got to be one of the first guys to do that. Then yes, this yeah. is, the movie theaters are very very new. Right, but also I imagine the curiosity must have been enormously high. Oh yes, You're like what the hell is that? Right, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So ten cents, sure, I can spend yeah. ten cents on that. I'd spend a dime on yeah. a movie. Yeah, but it's just like bam, and then get them out. Yep, That's... get them in, get them out. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. And then twenty minute body relax. He's limited to ten minutes, so we can have higher turnover. You're right. Okay. Uh, the Crystal Theater was so successful that he was able to open a second space on 2nd and Seneca in 1904, which he named the Pantages. Ah, uh, now we come to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he designed his theaters to be as beautiful and attractive as the acts the, patr- uh, 
As the acts of patrons were there to see, he loved the Greek-style architecture with columns, dome ceilings, and stained glass, bronze lining, murals, and tapestries with marble floors hi- highlighted the style of the building. The largest could seat over 2,000 people. Wow, and the so style he's spending a lot of money. He's spending a lot of money yeah, on these, yeah. He's doing high volume, but he's making the facility just look totally Exactly, gorgeous. yeah. The style mm. has since been dubbed Pantages Greek. Mm. All those old movie theaters and movie palaces and things like that. So he originated that style. Kind of, yeah. He, uh, he, well, was, he, he was the one that brought it. He stole from different people and combined it, but that's why we have that look of movie theaters right. today. Right, 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 right. Mm. Oh, that's great. Uh, 1905, he married Lois Mendenhall. Oh, it didn't work out with Kate. Well, Klondike Kate was distraught and filed a lawsuit against him <laughs> for breach of promise. Yeah, hell hath no fury like a burlesque dancer. Yeah, claiming he had promised to marry her. Oh. So there were seduction laws at the time <laughs> where if you, prom- you if, if you promised to marry someone and yeah. had sex with them, then yeah. they could, and then you didn't marry them, they could sue and you that's what she's for doing. seduction. Yeah, yeah. we'd all be in jail if that law still existed. Right? I mean, we've all done that. <laughs> we've all lied and said haven't that we, we were going to... Haven't we? I, you lost Chris, me on this one. We? Okay, fine. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. All right. That's, I'm a terrible person, <laughs> listener. Is that what you wanted to hear? <laughs> that's not what I was getting at, man. I just thought we'd share a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's what she's suing him for because that's 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 illegal and that's uh, yeah. yeah. So seduction, she was suing him under the seduction laws. Do you have an example of another seduction law? Uh, because I'm fascinated by this idea. There were there were there were a lot of instances of it happening. That was uh, something that if, if you go back and check out the episode on Harry Allen about the uh, the uh, the trans man who was living around oh. the turn of the century, right, right, right. Uh, he was he was charged with seduction. Oh, yeah, uh, and there's he was deceiving people. He was or? deceiving. Yeah, he was deceiving people. Okay, was, uh, but it's it's. He was, he was deceiving women mm-hmm. into believing that he was a man. That's what I mean. Yeah. Right. And so that fell under the seduction laws. That, right? Yeah, he was seducing them, essentially. Uh, so it's any time you're seducing under false pretenses. It's technically if you say that you're going to marry somebody. Okay, it's just is, the marriage. It's the real, thing. yeah, oh, okay. yeah. So if you go, there's, there's not, I don't have a whole lot, ton of, uh, I, I've done a little bit of research on it, but I don't, I, I can't cite the exact you know, sure. statute of the law right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, yeah. So it's illegal to say you're going to marry somebody, have sex with them, and then not marry them. Right. But you can get out of that by marrying them. And I think you have to be married to them for two years before you can divorce them. Yeah. <laughs> so right. So in order to avoid getting sued, you marry somebody so you, for two years and then you they, get the hell out. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, it's a it's a interesting. Yeah. Little you see that kind of stuff of legal fascinates history. me, right? Like just like the sodomy laws that are still on the books for a lot of states. Yeah. You know the fact that you 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 know you can't fillet your husband and right so, like if a cop saw you doing that in the window they could they could arrest you for that right? yeah our sodomy laws in washington were repealed in 1975 mm-hmm. um but the 1893 law doesn't actually call it sodomy they refer to it as the deplorable crime against nature ah. and then in 1909 i think it was mm-hmm. it was then ratified of not less than 10 not more than 14 years of hard labor and included sex with corpse and birds wow yeah no it's real fucked up because uh, going all the way back to Enumclaw <laughs> when that story broke. Right. There were no laws against speciality on the that's, books. That's yeah. right. And so, and, and with a lot of states. And that, mm-hmm. that story made national news. And for those of you listening, just go ahead and look that story up. Or don't. Yeah. yeah or, or, don't, or don't if you don't want to. don't do it. Pr- yeah. I probably won't be doing an episode on that. Yeah. <laughs> no. And then they set up, uh, but a lot of states ended up doing uh, bestiality laws because right. of that story. But it was illegal to have sex with a bird yeah, in that, Washington. Which is Which wow. is weird. There must be a story behind that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. If you want to learn more about uh, sodomy laws and, and uh, uh, that, that history, check out the episode on gay and lesbian history from, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, in 1907, now that we've gone down that little rabbit hole, uh, so she was seeking twenty five thousand dollars. You they, can't go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, so yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe I'll maybe after this episode, I'll add a rating to the show just to yeah, just yeah. to make sure. Yeah. Uh, so she was seeking twenty five thousand dollars. The two settled out of court. Um, in 1907, he opened a third theater and began expanding his operation down the West Coast, and that put him at odds with Seattle's reigning king of vaudeville, John Considine. Whoa. Considine had emerged victorious after shooting dead police chief William Meredith after a lengthy dispute between the two men in 1901. Mm-hmm. Uh, he walked away a free man and turned his attention to legitimate theater operations and away from the gambling and prostitution that had made him rich. Okay, and that's what the conflict was with the sheriff that he shot? Yeah, so, so if you want to learn more about that, check out there's a whole episode on John Considine. They, okay. uh, basically what happened was... Uh, 
uh, Meredith used to work for Considine. Mm-hmm. They had a falling out. Meredith rose up through the ranks really quickly and became police chief. Uh, and Considine was running this brothel gambling hall. Gotcha. And so Meredith was enforcing the laws against gambling and prostitution and drinking in saloons, but only at Considine's establishment. Okay. So they started blaspheming each other in the press. Confidence threw his weight around. He got Meredith kicked out of office. Meredith grabbed a shotgun, two pistols, and a dirk knife, started heading down 2nd Avenue looking for Considine. Considine was going north, went into a drugstore, and he was shot and killed. Wow. In a bar tell drugs. And then he's like, now finally I can do theater. Yeah. Well, he was. He went to trial. He was. He was acquitted sure. because yeah. because Meredith was gunning for him. Yeah, and yeah. Kind of kind of shot him in self defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he was like, "Well, I'm going to move into more legitimate trade." Because I just got to dance. I just got to dance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from Skid Road by Murray Morgan. Quote, Considine had the advantage of political and financial connections. Pantages had the advantage of genius. A man without roots, a man who knew six languages but could write in none of them, a man who had traveled widely and always among the lower class, a man without illusions, tough with the cynicism that comes from rubbing elbows with pugs and pimps and gamblers, he had an unerring instinct for what would please people most. Yeah, sure. Yeah, with the, well, you know, especially the unwashed masses. I mean, oh, yeah. If he's trying to get people in to in, turn over and he's selling right, a cheap yeah. ticket, of course he's going to know what he's right. going to turn their crank. Especially right? going to all these different cultures and seeing what appeals to Absolutely. people universally. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, that's fascinating. Uh, Constantine and Pantages went to great effort to one-up one in each other and steal each other's acts. Uh, performers who knew about the rivalry between the two men would pit them against each other. They would make an agreement with one and then see if the other would beat the offer. Wow. Plain both sides. Yeah. Constantine would send his men to the train station to intercept Pantages' performers and offer them a better, better deal. <laughs> Pantages would arrive at the train sa- station to inter- uh, intercept Constantine's act, claiming to be sent from Constantine, uh-huh. only to take their equipment to his own theater and refuse to release it until they agreed to play at his establishment first. Wow, just hold the, hold the equipment hostage. Yeah. All right. He threatened to burn the xylophones of an act who attempted to back out on their contract when Considine offered them double the money. Okay, so this is very exciting. This is like, this is take no prisoners theater. Yeah. Yeah, I wish yeah. it were still that way. Yeah. Everyone's talking about theater dying. Right? Everyone. And if we went back to tactics like this, you could bet people would be interested. Theater's always been dying. Yeah. Theater's well, always... like I'm working for Wood Know this summer. It'd be mm-hmm. great if Green Stage came along and said, Felker, <laughs> so... we're going we're gonna to offer you... <laughs> We're going to offer you a few hundred dollars more to come over and play this part, right? Or even if they took me hostage and they threatened to, I don't know, <laughs> burn my costume or something, right? So I wouldn't have a costume to perform in? I mean, that, that's highly unlikely. Well, Green but. Stage, over the, last, over the last 12 months, they've had two mm-hmm. sets of costumes stolen. Oh, yeah. So, oh, you worked for Green Stage. I did. I worked for Green Stage ah, last summer. That's yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, our costumes for, for our, we were doing the Backyard Bard, and our costume got know. stolen. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, but now I am. Sure. So, uh, yeah. Uh, for, for anyone associated with Wooden No, we know you didn't steal Green Stage's costume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, this is also, uh, there's these traveling acts that are going from town to town, and there's not, you know, a great wealth of local acts yeah. that can bring in this kind of draw. Sure. And this is also, in vaudeville, you could do the same act for your entire career. You right. could do the same ten minutes and just go from town to town to town repeating the same so act. This, so th- these acts have a certain degree of notoriety. They're well-practiced. They've, yeah. They, you know, they have these a are, hook. They're, these succe- are, they're established and successful. Right. These okay. are polished, polished acts. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, some local yokel's not going to pull the same way that the act coming in from out of Right, exactly. Yeah. So I think that if you tried to pull that hey green stage, why don't you give me double the money? <laughs> yeah. Then they would just the would know would just say, Oh, we can find someone else. Yeah. That's, that's not an You're issue. a local yeah. actor. Yeah. You're not a national draw. Right. To which I would reply, correct. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say yet. But uh, <laughs> but point taken. I almost said it. Uh, in 1906, Considine partnered with promoter and former New York politician Big Tim Sullivan. Also in 1906, Pantages bought a sixth theater circuit based, circuit based out of San Francisco, whose primary venue was destroyed in the Great San Francisco Fire that same year. Mm-hmm. In 1909, Pantages had a string of theaters on the West Coast, as well as mansions in Seattle and Los Angeles. So kid ran away from home at nine in the uh, Greek islands, and now he's got mansions, mansions up and down the West Coast. Yeah, amazing. By 1911, the, uh, 1911, the 
Sullivan Considine Circuit had become the first transcontinental affordable vaudeville theater in America. The f- circuit was so big they could offer performers seventy week contracts. Wow! That's, yeah, yeah. See again, that that's livable wage right there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, sorry, I have to go back. Um, I missed what happened with the lawsuit with Kate. Oh, they settled out of court. Oh, they did. They settled okay. out of court. You already yeah. said that, didn't mm-hmm. you? All right, I missed it. She wanted twenty five thousand dollars, and they reached an out of court okay, settlement. Okay, great. It was in the back of my mind. Yeah, I was like, oh man, what happened there? Okay. Okay, so now he's he's kicking ass. He's kicking ass. He's, They're both doing pretty well. Yeah. Pantages and Constantine right. are both kind of thriving. Sure. Uh, Which but, that's, uh, it's. I mean, in all seriousness, it's amazing how well that works. How when competition you, breeds. Mm, yeah. Exactly. And that uh, if you're just kind of sitting on your laurels, if, if you've established something that's fairly successful and you have nobody pushing you, mm-hmm. that thing tends to stagnate. So it doesn't surprise me that yeah. the two of them going at it back and forth. Right. They both actually pushes each other to be better. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, Pantages had an advantage that Considine couldn't compete with, though. He had an eye for talent and a keen ability to determine what act would become successful. While other bookers were trying to book get the biggest name acts or acts that had been successful on Broadway, Pantages knew his audience and knew what they were going to like. Right. So, so he knew that something that's big on Broadway in New York, as for this you know highfalutin crowd, yeah. might not work as well. Right. In all the other theaters around the country. Right. Whereas Considine is saying, this act is on Broadway, and so therefore it's good. Right. So other people will like it. Sure. Yeah. I'm not necessarily right. taking into consideration who his audience Which is. Which also happens now, too, in that you have plenty of producers that think that this is the biggest act or the biggest name, and that's going to make it successful. Whereas, like, you have a more savvy producer who's like, no, no, this is the thing that's going to connect with the, this particular right. audience. Yep. And with the breadth of experience that he has, mm-hmm. you can see him choosing those acts to fit in that particular community. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Very, yeah. very shrewd businessman. Yeah. Uh, he made sure to keep all acts short and keeping the audience engaged throughout the entire performance. He fought against the closure of theaters on Sundays on the grounds that the audiences were working class and ought to be able to enjoy entertainment on their days of rest. Mm-hmm. He personally oversaw all bookings. A typical show might have as many as ten short acts, ranging from musicians to dancers to comedians to jugglers to anything else. See, that's great. Because, you know, that's another thing um, in theater happening right now. Uh, not, not too badly, but a lot of times a theater, and I'm not naming names here, uh, but they'll kind of misjudge the the endurance of their audience. Yeah, yeah, and so and, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. Like mm. most audiences, if you go an hour and twenty minutes with no intermission, they will kiss you after the show, right? If you mm. just burn through it, and then mm. then you have shows that are, it's you know to tell the story effectively, it has to be three hours long, right? But you're still you're really pushing your audience when you do. Well, that. I'm a big fan of uh, a show is as long as it needs to be, mm-hmm. and if it's any longer than Fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good point. And that's the yeah. big, like, that's one of the things when I hear people telling stories or, like, in a, in a professional capacity, I just want to say, use less words. Just, yeah. You're using so many more words than you need to use. Mm-hmm. You're you're using 20 words when 10 words can do. And I think that's also a big comedy thing. When you do comedy for a long sure. time, you learn how to get that brevity and how to get that. Uh, I think it was Vonnegut who said that a joke is what happens when you get the truth faster than you expect it. <laughs> that's or good. faster and more directly uh-huh. than you expect it. That's so, yeah, having this short, tight... I think the the best thing I've seen maybe ever on stage, but at least in the last couple of years, was Come From Away at oh, yeah. the Seattle Rep. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And that was, uh, I think, 95 minutes. There you it was go. super short, no intermission, just yeah. but it had so much content yeah. and so much what happened in that 90 minutes. Well, also, attention spans have changed significantly, too, in mm-hmm. that... Uh, it it, it, it might have been like when you went to the theater, there was a time where that was your afternoon. You know, you went out and you got lunch or, you know, if you're going to a yeah. matinee and then you sit to the matinee and maybe the matinee is three hours long. But it's your whole afternoon. It's the whole experience of mm-hmm. going to theater. And there's still a place for that. Yeah. For sure. But well, that's the, just... Uh, the Adventures people... of Cavalier and Clay at mm-hmm. Book It, which is five and a half hours long. Great show. Great show. Right. Loved it. That's an example of they needed the time to tell that story. Yeah. You know, and when I heard about the length of that show, I was like, because I love that book. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my god! Oh my god! Five, yeah, five and a half hours, and like Jesus, people are gonna die. You can watch their beards grow. Uh, but then, uh, of course, it turned out to be a very successful show. And, and just like you said, uh, a show is as long as it needs to be, and that show needed to be that long. Yeah, but still, that's a hell of a long. Oh break. yeah, yeah. <laughs> then a dinner break, which was helpful. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, by 1913. 
John Constantine's partner, Big Tim Sullivan, had gone insane due to syphilis and could no longer be a trustworthy promoter. Aww. Yeah. The circuit, theater, the circuit of theaters was a shaky real estate venture because each theater was built mortgaging the other theaters. Oh, okay. So it kind of creates so this... build another one. Yeah, and then Dominoes. they would mortgage that one. Exactly, and that mm-hmm. creates this domino effect. Uh, Constantine was also tired. He had to travel 100,000 miles a year and wanted more stability in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1914, they sold the Considine Sullivan circuit, circuit to a uh, Chicago syndicate and another private investor, making a down payment of $400,000 with the rest of the $4 million to be paid out over time. Then World War I broke out. Oh, wow. So which one, which one went nuts with the syphilis? Uh, Big Tim Sullivan. Considine's, okay, Considine's Sullivan. partner mm-hmm. okay, went, went nuts with the sure. syphilis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so after, because of World War I, the international circuit was completely shut down. So they couldn't get international acts. They couldn't get acts from Europe. They sure. couldn't. Uh, the world the, at war. Yeah. yeah, and the national circuit suffered as, as a result. Mm-hmm. Uh, Considine attempted to get things going again, but was unsuccessful, and the entire enterprise fell apart. Uh-huh. By the end of World War One, Pantages had clearly come out on top nationally as the preeminent vaudeville circuit in North America. Wow. By 1926, he owned 30 theaters and had a controlling stake in 42 others. Wow. So massive, massive, powerful guy yeah, yeah. in the vaudeville world. Holy shit. Uh, when talkies came into popularity in the late 1920s, Pantages saw it as the end of vaudeville. And sold his business to RKO, Radio Keith Orpheum. Sure. So he was really he was ready to like adapt as soon as the talks yeah. came out. He was saying like, so oh, there was no like my my way of doing things is is gone. Yeah. It's clearly this new technology. This is the new thing. Yeah, I'm out. So there's no sentimentality attached to it. it no, or it doesn't appear to be. Any doesn't appear to be. Yeah, on to the next new thing. Right. Oh, wow. So he sold his his the- circuit of theaters for twenty four million dollars. So he would own Oculus Rift right now, right? Kind of, yeah, I don't know if that's going to be the next big I'm, thing. I'm just saying virtual reality, though, is probably going to be the next That was thing. like 1996's big yeah. thing. I saw a guy in a Starbucks with one of those things, yeah. like, like looking around, and it was like... But I'm talking about like video game technology. You don't yeah. think that virtual reality is the way it's going to go? I don't know. Because uh, the thing is about technology, especially any kind of visual technology, right? It's typically Van Eyes that decides. I'm talking about porn, baby. No, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? So... Because that's because the they, VHS or laser discs, they went VHS. If it DVD was, or uh, uh, Blu-ray, Blu-ray, they, they went chose, Blu-ray. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that they're probably looking very hard. Oh, you mean at, DVD or laser disc? Uh, no, no, oh, laser disc. disc or DVD. But I remember it was laser disc or these big ass. I know. I, re- I remember laser discs. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching those in school. Yeah, yeah. So it was but, yeah. VHS, or VHS or laser, or laser disc. disc, and then it okay. was HD or Blu-ray. That's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they, uh, went, they went Blu-ray, so the whole industry went Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. So I have a feeling that, and I'm not sure if it's Oculus Rift, but I think virtual reality will become a thing, I mostly just, because of the porn application. I find and talk about touching yourself. Fourteen-year-olds are never going to leave their bedrooms <laughs> ever. I I personally find 3D movies and things really annoying. Sure. I would always rather see it in 2D. So mm-hmm. I've heard maybe I'm just not. Maybe I'm not a visionary. I'm no Pantages, so uh, <laughs> hey, I hey, I don't man. know. Hey, you're doing a podcast. I am doing a podcast, yeah. yeah so That's on the cutting edge. Yeah, eight years after they start, <laughs> I jumped on board. <laughs> so don't sell yourself short. Okay. Uh, so he sold his uh, theater circuit to RKO for $24 million just before the market crashed mm-hmm. and the Great Depression started. Wow. So he got out just in time. Yeah, jeez, that's, God, that's amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, it was also in 1929 that 54 year old, year old Pantages was arrested for raping 17 year old Eunice Pringle. Aww. Yeah. Uh, she was a dancer who went to Pantages in hopes of getting booked on the impresario stages. Yeah. On August 9th, 1929, dozens of witnesses saw her running out of his private office in the mezzanine of his theater uh, with her clothes in shambles and screaming that she had been raped. <sighs> Pantages' story was that he had turned her down for an interview several times, but she was persistent, and as soon as they were alone, she tore off her clothes and threw herself at him. So... That's uh, that, yeah. That's hard because uh, yeah. right? I've been I've been rooting for him. I gotta admit, I've been kind of rooting for him. Yeah. and that's that's really rough. He was convicted by a jury, sentenced to fifty years in prison. Wow. He served. Uh, he was in j- he jailed for several months, maintaining his innocence, and got a second trial where he was acquitted. Right. Uh, there's another story that Joe Kennedy. John Kennedy's father was trying to buy Pantages' theaters and paid the girl to claim he attacked her in order to discredit him. Like a big conspiracy. Yeah. yeah. But this hasn't been verified. Of course. So we really, we don't know what happened. We never will know but what happened. But he did get acquitted. He did get acquitted. And he turned around and he bought the prison and then he started a prison system. <laughs> uh, no. He did, oh. get, he did get acquitted. He, he uh, Yeah, so a few months after the first trial, 
Yeah. New evidence is introduced, and, okay. he's, and he's acquitted in the second trial. Right. So it's really, it's one of those things where we really don't know, and yeah. we never will know. Um, and, it, and that was John Kennedy's father. Allegedly, wanted, yeah. Ooh. So and the Kennedys have never done anything shady, so... Right, yeah. They, Kennedys certainly didn't make their money from bootlegging. No, no, no. And no, then no. turn around and try to fight all the organized crime that made them rich in the first place. Absolutely That is not. certainly not something that... That happened. Right. I'm glad we agree on that. We're both adamantly agreeing. I think we can say whatever we want about the Kennedys, because none of them are alive anymore, so... Uh, mm, I, you know, there's one. That's true. There's one. I don't know. All, I don't you, know who... all you need is one. Yeah. <laughs> all you need is one. So, be careful. Yeah. Uh, though Considine had been Pantages and Pantages had been rivals professionally, the two kept an amicable relationship. They weren't good friends, but the two men liked and respected each other. Uh, each seeing the rising power of motion pictures moved to Los Angeles. Pantages' daughter Carmen married Considine's son, John Jr., wow. and the families both went on to enjoy success as producers in Hollywood. Wow, well, they, they joined forces. They kind of did, yeah. Wow, they, like the they, two royal families yeah. of Hollywood. Yeah, combined. exactly. Oh, that's amazing. It's like the Lannisters and the Starks coming together. Uh, you wouldn't ever expect that. To no, happen. you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for the back end of his life, Pantages got, uh, gained the nickname Alexander the Great. Alexander Pantages died of heart failure on February 17th, 1936. The Pantages Theater on 3rd Avenue and University Street in Seattle was torn down in 1965, but the Pantages Theater in Hollywood still stands to this day. Wow. That's wow. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. All that. I mean, I think I've said wow like 100,000 times during this whole thing. About that, yeah. Yeah, and fascinating, which is, that's my version of insight, is wow and fascinating. But mm -hmm. it, really, it truly is. We also talked about 14-year-olds touching themselves. That's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's, that's insight. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's also very insightful. But the whole story is, it yeah. really is amazing. This so, kid that ran away from home with And his name nothing. was Pericles. Pericles Pantages. Pericles Pantages. And he uh, ends up as this just world-renowned international yeah. impresario, one of the most successful producers of all time. Uh -huh. Just by working, working his ass off yeah. his entire life. Sure, getting malaria, almost dying. Right. Yeah. Falling Do off, falling double off boats. Double malaria. Double malaria. Yeah. yeah. And then cured by falling off a boat. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for listening to the Seattle Files. Thank you, Brandon, for being here. Of course. Uh, if you have a topic suggestion that you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Uh, like us on Facebook. Subscribe and rate the show in iTunes. Leave us a review if you can. We're also on Twitter at, at the Seattle Files. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next Tuesday with a new topic and a new guest. And a new guest. And a new guest. And a new guest. And a new guest.